Welcome back for another video on making the most out of your investment in a RoboLabs RoboJetFloss vertical cotton candy machine brought to you by FloatingCottonCandy.com. This specific video isn't necessarily about making cotton candy, but making the best impression with your cotton candy machine. Uh, specifically talking about when you are vending cotton candy cones at an event, presumably uh, to promote your business or selling the cones for profit. One of the limitations or hidden benefits of the machine itself is that uh, when you're actually producing cones, crowds will draw around just based on the fact that they've never seen anything like it, and it's such an impressive and mesmerizing event. However, the, the limitation here is when the machine is off, even with a nice presentation, our four-wheel cart, and with a half bubble on top, as clean and crisp as the presentation might be, people will walk by and not realize it's different than any other cotton candy machine. In fact, uh, if you've run events yourself, uh, you have seen people walk by and maybe the kids, maybe the parents look over and go, oh, look, you know, cotton candy. And if they're interested, they might come back later and they might ask you when you're opening uh, or maybe you're open and just don't have any customers yet. It's really easy to confuse this with a standard cotton candy machine. Uh, just looking at it, it's a machine, it's a cart, it's a bowl, it's a bubble. The half bubble might be a little confusing if they know anything about cotton candy. And of course, if you're not using a half bubble, then there'd be no reason to suspect anything was different here at all. So of many of the tips and, and, and tactics that I have to overcome that, uh, a simple one is just to have a few cones for display. Now, one of the problems with displaying cotton candy is you, uh, you can't make a whole bunch ahead of time without putting them in bags, and once they're in bags, then again, the problem is it doesn't look any different than any other product. Uh, I tried in the past of making trees out of cotton candy cones, but as many of you will know if you have experience, uh, they're not gonna hang on the stick very well. So what I find is uh, two techniques that do work for me is to make just a few cones ahead of time that I can display on a table for presentation purposes. And while somebody not watching the process won't get the full impact, it will still grab their attention. And then I have come up with a way to make a demonstration cone that uh, is an attention getter and will last longer than an actual physical cone ready to eat. Uh, the other thing this does for me as a matter of advantage is while I am making the demonstration cones, then the floss is flying and that will attract attention and often create orders so that what often happens in a sparsely populated event where I might not have a line at all times is while I'm making the demonstration cones, people will then come over to watch the process and they'll either buy the cone I'm making or one of the demonstrations. And so uh, it will actually generate business and I will endlessly then be producing. Whereas if I was simply waiting for my first customer, again, the problem is people can walk by and go, oh, look, honey, you know, cotton candy machine, maybe we'll come back later. And that doesn't really generate any business for me at all. So uh, the twofold benefit is the demonstrations uh, just sitting on the table will attract attention, but importantly, uh, the act of making the demonstration cones then attracts attention. And so I can really double or triple my business at an event that isn't, uh, isn't heavily attended. Now, again, this won't be very important for heavily attended events um, because once you fire the machine up, it sort of attracts attention, it attracts crowds, and you might not ever turn it off if there's enough, enough attendees. But if you, again, are something that doesn't have a lot of attendance, this is really a way to boost your production and have more, more hours running, more minutes running, more cones always being produced. So um, get a look at this picture, realize that it looks nice, the machine looks attractive, everything's clean, but if you were just walking by and had no idea what this machine was capable of, you would have no reason to suspect that this was any different than any other cotton candy machine that you've ever seen. So we're gonna fade out and fade back after making a few demonstration cones. All right, now fading back in after making three sample cones, I think you can get a pretty good idea that walking by this display is a little bit different than walking by what you saw just a few seconds ago. And all I had to do was spin three cones, plus a little bit of magic. Now. I want to re-emphasize that my experience has been that the process of making the cones is really the best sales technique. So usually while I'm making the cones and putting them in the stands, that generates enough attention that I immediately start selling the cones. Seldom will I ever be standing somewhere in front of three cones like this just waiting for something to happen. 
typically what will happen is I'll, I'll put one or two or three in the stand as I'm going. Somebody will walk up and they'll either buy one right out of the stand, which then allows me to finish the one I'm producing and put it in the stand, or they'll, they'll say they want the one I'm making. So I give them the option. I say, are you interested in a, in a cone? And the answer is almost always yes. So then it's, well, would you like one of the ones that's ready or would you like for this one to be finished? Impatient as many people are, they'll say, well, I'd like one that's already made. And I'll simply ask them, point to which one you'd like and I'll sell them that one. Uh, obviously, if they want to wait for the one I've got, that's fine too. Um, I'll reiterate, you don't want to make a lot of these ahead of time. As you can see, they take a lot of space. I've only put two on the table right now. Usually, I'll do three. I'll have two large ones in back and, and one in front. I don't make a lot more than that, depending on the environmental conditions. Cotton candy doesn't hold up real well, real long, unless it's in a bag, which is why so many people sell bag candy. And with humidity, of course, uh, it can uh, slouch and drip even, even faster. But um, three on a table is usually not a problem. Sometimes I'll have two tables, and if the conditions are right, it's busy, and if I have an assistant, I might have five or six. But uh, again, the point being that uh, this is what I do to generate business when when it's a slower event there's not as many people walking by or at the beginning of an event where it just looks like a cotton candy machine and there's no obvious benefit or nothing special about it jumps out at you so having said that the key to doing this is simply how to make the stands and um, and it's deceptively simple so the first thing I'm going to show you is that I, I made one that is sort of a cylinder and I made one that is sort of a, um, a Christmas tree cone, whatever you want to call it, smurf head. Kids call them different things. And uh, in order to have them stand upright, I mean, they're not heavy, right? So you don't need much in terms of a stand, you just need something. And in order to achieve that, um, what I found, I shouldn't say found, what I decided to do, sort of came up with some experimentation. But what I simply did was crafted something out of plumbing PVC and believe it or not, uh, uh, weight. So. I don't want anything tall. I don't need anything to offer a lot of stability. I need something small that I can carry with me that packs up, inexpensive, just a little bit of stability. But again, these aren't heavy, so um, you don't need a whole lot. So what, what I came up with is just uh, PVC uh, for plumbing supply. And uh, you can get this Home Depot, Lowe's, Menards, <laughs> hardware store, anywhere. And it's just, uh, just PVC piping that cuts easy and glues easy and then uh, little glue connectors. So all I did was buy uh, some glue connectors, cut the pipe short, paint it pink or whatever color you want. Pink seemed right to me. And then, <laughs> I don't know how this occurred to me, but the idea of, well, how do I make it stand up? And I thought about you know, building wood stands and just a million ideas came to mind. But you want something kind of small, low, and heavy. So it occurred to me that the diameter was pretty close to what standard um, dumbbells use. Now, at the Olympic size, um, for those of you that lift, you realize Olympic bells have larger holes, but sort of the US standard uh, weights have about a one inch hole here, and that fits these PVCs pretty snug. And so I can just unpack these and carry, you know, uh, I, I made like eight, so I can, I can set up quite a few. And this, I think this pipe is like two bucks and the connectors are maybe 35 cents or some silly number at a, at a, you know, like a home improvement store. So we're talking about basically nothing to make these stands and uh, they take like no space to carry. The, the only trick is, and I don't think there's a link to this on my site, but go online and search for a pound and a quarter. I had, had been using two and a half pounds because those are pretty common. I owned some of those. That's how I sort of came up with this. But um, for having four stands to add 10 pounds to my, to my luggage that I <laughs> lug around to events seemed a bit excessive. So I searched and I found that you can in fact get uh, one and a quarter pound little dumbbells that have the same one inch hole. So I'd rather carry uh, four sets of these for uh, half the weight than not. And uh, so that's what I do. And uh, the, the dumbbells, unfortunately, are like three bucks a piece. I say unfortunately, because <laughs> it seems like a lot, but uh, obviously to make a nice little stand that's portable and, and holds the, these just fine is, uh, is peanuts. So it doesn't, doesn't really amount to anything. One cone pays for the stand. And I've paid for these stands many times over. So uh, order yourself a few and uh, you have portable little stands that uh, fold down flat, I shouldn't say fold down flat, that break down flat, and uh, little PVC pieces, and if you lose one or break one, I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just dirt cheap. Now, 
This thing over here is a little different. Uh, in fact, it's a lot different. What I wanted was something that I could make larger than a typical serving and leave up. Because if you know anything about cotton candy cones, if you use sticks or straws, eventually the candy starts to slide down the stick, the pointy surface pokes through, you know, it's sugar, so it doesn't have a lot of structural integrity. And I did want something that I could leave up for longer than a typical cone before it starts sliding down, because I need to sell these ones that I, that I put up, you know, in 5, 10, 15 minutes. Otherwise, I have to hang them upside down to get them back to where they are and sometimes add some new floss to freshen them up. So I had the idea to make essentially a dummy floss cone, but dummy floss cones are kind of hard to make and they don't look as appetizing and I don't have a $10,000 budget to pay an art house the way you know a restaurant might have a, a piece of cherry pie in the case that isn't real cherry pie but looks like they're cherry pie. So my thought was this, I needed something with a substantial base but that I could spin into a cone that was reusable, durable, and realistic. And I, I think you get the picture that that's what I ended up with. Now, on the base of this, uh, I want to point out, I'm using the exact same little PVC stand, but I did use a, a five pound weight instead of a, a one and a half because this is bigger and heftier and on a longer stick. So leverage and a high center of gravity means that you need a slightly larger weight to do this. And I've put it on a, a quarter inch or a five eighth inch dowel rod. More weight needs a little more heft. So here's the, uh, the, the trick. I hope you find this amusing. I do. What I did to create a base was I started with a uh, foam cone that you can buy, I think, Walmart, Michaels, any craft store. And I started with a foam cone because what I want is something that's wider at the, at the bottom than at the top. So that gives it sort of a resistance to slippage. And the cone at the top, of course, isn't pointy the way our sticks and straws that we use for servings are. Um, and the one underneath this, I may have started even a little bit larger than this. You can get these in a variety of sizes. But it doesn't need to be too terribly large. And then I glued it onto the dowel rod. However, this foam will break up. It, I mean, it's not impervious to damage. And it, I figured it would only last so long. If you've worked with any of these cone things, they fall apart pretty easy. So the next step, and this is where I think things get kind of amusing, or at least I think they're amusing, is I, uh, I wanted it to be durable. You know, if I'm going to put the work into it, I, I'm not saying this will last forever, but I'd like it to last a little while and be uh, washable without dissolving. So I then started thinking, well, what could I add to the foam that would be durable, that I could rinse right off and uh, use again and again and again? So I, again, I don't know how I got the idea, but it occurred to me that this Great Stuff foam, and there's other brands, but it's foam insulation I'd used before around windows and doors, and it goes on in a uh, sort of like a large, thick line of caulk, and you can get it so that it goes on in different diameters. And I noticed that when it sets up, it gets really hard. You can get some that stay permeable, but the ones I'd used in the past get really hard, and then you can trim them with a uh, utility knife, for example, when you're, when you're insulating windows and doors. And so that made me realize that that stuff's pretty tough. So what, what exactly I did was I uh, had a friend uh, spin this for me, and when I say spin this, what I mean is I glued this onto the dowel rod, and then I had a friend just gently spin it at a regular speed, and I applied foam. I had to do it in two or three layers, because if you try and do it all at once, it gets heavy, sags, and falls off. Put on a layer, let it sit an hour, put on a layer, let it sit an hour. And so I built it up into a base cone. And so this base cone then takes about two minutes because I'm um, to, to build into a demo cone because what I'm doing is I'm adding two or three inches of actual floss on top. And so that then I stick in the stand. And as you saw in the video, it's, uh, it looks like a, a regular cotton candy cone and uh, bigger than, than most they're going to be able to make. And the nice thing is, depending on the environmental conditions, this thing will, uh, will stand up and keep from sliding down and falling apart for a really long period of time. Uh, I've had them stay in good shape and be totally uh, realistic for as long as two or three hours. But the nice thing is, if it, uh, if it starts to 
droop a little bit or sag, because uh, eventually it will, again, in a human environment sooner than others, I can either just rinse it off, wipe it off, scrape it off with my hand. I really dunked it in the, in the bowl here because I wanted to get it completely clean for you to see. I wouldn't have to do that in an event. I might just pat down the cotton, put it over and spin another inch on it so I can very quickly freshen it back up. But it makes for just an awesome display that costs I don't know, 10 or $15 maybe to make. I don't remember what these, uh, what these cones are, five, five bucks or so, dowel rod, couple dollars, a uh, can of great stuff. I think it was like $3, mostly just my time. Now I painted it pink. There, there's really no reason I had to do that. I just I know, felt like doing it. And I think then if the, if the floss gets a little thin, um, maybe from wind or environmental conditions, I, I just figured having pink underneath made it a little more convincing. But when there's enough floss on it, it doesn't really matter whether you paint it or not. But I also thought the paint might help the great stuff last longer. So far, I've been using this for uh, about six months and it it's, uh, still has great integrity. So I, I imagine after a year or two or some period of time, I'll have to make a new one. But again, the cost is peanuts compared to the effect. The only distinction, again, is you need more like a five pound weight uh, or a 10 or whatever you have, happen to have handy in order to make it stand up and, and withstand being bumped into. So uh, the purpose of this video, again, is, is really, I'm not saying you have to do any of this, uh, it depends on the type of events you do. If people are hiring you on an hourly basis and that's your thing, this doesn't matter. If you're only doing super busy events with lots of crowds and lots of kids so that you immediately fire up uh, once people see the machine running and see what you're capable of, pretty much you never turn it off, so this may not matter. But every now and then I do an event where you know they start late or the crowd is sporadic, maybe around lunchtime, certain breaks, um, certain events. There are times where it's slow, and anytime this isn't running, then you run the risk of people just walking by and thinking it's another cotton candy machine. So the, the twofold purpose, again, I'll just state it one last time, is that having the demonstrations, even though that's not the same as seeing them be made, just looking at the cones makes it obvious it's not your typical cotton candy. And the process of making the demonstrations means I get to be spinning floss that I don't just have to throw away, and that attracts people to the machine. So usually as soon as I start doing that, people start coming over, even if it's, even if it's a thin crowd. Somebody will come over and want to buy some. So it's a way to generate business essentially out of thin air. So a little bit of marketing tips from the field and uh, how to make some very simple, very inexpensive displays that pay for themselves essentially in the first hour of operation. So I hope you find that useful and uh, can find a way to put that into your business using the Robo Jet Floss for flying cotton candy machines. If you are using a RoboJet floss or plan on using one in the future and you're seriously considering it as a prospect, stop by floatingcottoncandy.com. I have a whole page dedicated to additional tips, tricks, uh, ways to save money, ways to market yourself, and it's called the RoboJet Boss Success Guide. It is not publicly available, however, it is a hidden link, but if you fill out one of the forms on the site and simply ask for the link, I will provide it no problem, no questions asked. Uh, I don't do a lot of follow-up spam or anything of that nature. I just don't want the link public for uh, a couple simple reasons. One, a lot of the links change and um, it needs to be up, updated and maintained uh, pretty regularly. Two, I will occasionally, and by that I mean a couple times a year, if I make substantial changes, I'll let people know. But most importantly, I, I just don't want casual visitors and competitors to be able to see the information I'm providing there. So I do kind of reserve it for people that are either using a RoboJet floss from RoboLabs or people that are at least serious seriously considering it. So if you'd like that additional information, just ask for it. Again, asking for the RoboJet Boss Success Guide. I will send you that link and then save that email. And uh, whether you're interested in that or not, be sure to stop back and see future videos on how to get the most out of the RoboLabs RoboJet Floss Machine. And thank you for watching this one.